Issues of navigation in the quantum resource space. I don't need to have some reasons for this, but I'm actually not to navigate source space at all. Maybe we want to get an understanding of the softnesses, and maybe we want to take some new check. Maybe we want to implement a new feature, or we want to refactor some calls or other reasons. I actually want to navigate software systems. And when we do that in a small talk ID, here I took the example of Squeak, I could also take file, or even simple small talk. And then you get this, so you get a lot of a lot of windows, a lot of difficult things to see something here that's really not easy to find. It's it's this way in that mess here. And then you look at the small book ID as it's currently implemented in Squeak, then you see that this kind of patterns that this ID is using are really old. So this kind of concept has been invented 30 years ago. So they, they, they didn't evolve since then, basically. So most concepts here are 30 years old, so they are a bit old now. I have some problems indicators for this, that we really have a problem when we navigate software systems. But I did, I recorded the development session of 20 developers that tried to fix a defect in a minor software system, so it was a medium-sized application written in speech small talk and record all the navigation activities they performed during 30 minutes. And then I tried to analyze the data I obtained from, from these developers and found out that they in average, on average try to switch windows around 30 to 40 times. So just 30 minutes they switched between one window and the other even nearly 40 times. And they also have many revisits of methods of classes, so they did it in several classes, some methods more than once. So here I record 35 revisits on average for all those 20 people. So this means in common, on average that they visited 45 entities that they opened, like class methods, visit 45% of all those entities more than once. And also record the edit navigation ratio. This, so this means this ratio means how many navigation actions do I have to perform until I can finally find a method that I want to change that I want to modify. And here the, the, the percentage was below 3%, so this means that on, on average I have to navigate 50, around 50 entities until I find an entity that I can actually modify. So it's really hard to find the right place in source code that I want to change, that I want to touch. So here a list of problems. So we have many windows open, and we have many switches between those windows. And we have also many source entities that can visit several times. This is something we can analyze from the data. I get it, and also the other problem. We really have to do a lot of navigation in any point based software system to find defects, to find opportunities to reflect the code. So navigation is really the most important thing we have to do when we develop software and make, make that software. So now my question that I ask myself is how can I actually improve navigation? Or because I want to do that in the ID of course, what is actually missing in the ID? So what do we need to change from the ID point of view to make that better navigation of software systems? And then we then try to come up with five different ideas, five different concepts, how we can actually improve navigation. And the first idea, the first basic idea is to represent working sets in the ID. So to have kind of context, like I mean, for this particular bond I need to analyze plus A, plus B, plus C, and plus D. So this is a context, a working set in which I'm working. This was one idea. And another idea was to tackle the problem of the distributed code. So often one class is implementing package B and one class, another class that is related to the other class A is implementing yet another package that is maybe far away statically from the first package. So we have a lot of distributed code that we need to navigate. And then a third concept, the third idea is to reveal hidden dependencies. So Maybe I know that plus four and bar are communicating to each other, but we do not see it in the ID. The ID is not showing me that uh, class bar is also communicating with class hidden. And I want to 
make this kind of independence is obvious in the ID to better navigate them. And of course, many dependencies are hidden because we do not see directly runtime information. So we do not see what kind of classes are really used at runtime. We just see the static source of the ID. So another idea is to make obvious or to make visible runtime information in the ID. And then my last point, the fifth point, is to reduce the window play. So as you have seen on the screenshot before, we open many windows. And now one idea is to actually be able to reduce automatically those numbers of windows that we have open at any point in time. And now we'll give you some ideas we implemented to tackle those five points. And we'll start with the working set. So all the things we did, we did in the screen for the file ID. And here for the representing context, we introduced the concept of smart groups. So smart groups I can create as a user, can say I want to randomize the lobby features so I create a group called lobby and then I manually have all the classes that are, that are taking part in the lobby feature. So I can also have an automatic working set. So for instance if I modify a package A and also package B, then these packages A and B are, are also are automatically part of the working set of the current working set. Also when I submit the search query, in the top bar, then I get the working set with the results of this search query. So this is the concept of smart groups. Another concept we introduced are navigation history, as we know them from web browsers. So you just have a list of all the history items you navigated in the past, or also all the history and navigation items you uh, will navigate in the future. So if you went back in this screen, you see your future items and concepts, like in a web browser. And that kind of navigation history we also have a context and it's the context of the navigation history actually performed which is now visible before it was not directly visible. And then another way to create context is to be able to edit or modify more than one method in the same browser at the at any point in time. So with that data I can open more than one method in the tab below. So there is the identify cases in four methods. Now to make distributed code very accessible, here is one contribution for that, that is called a package view. So normally when you navigate the package you see, you do not directly see the extension methods for instance. So here in that package view, when you click on the package, you also see all the classes that this package extends. So that, that, that way we can make things that belong together and we can make them more better visible at the same place showing extended classes and extended methods in the same view. Similar for the hierarchy view, this is a feature that simple small talk has already implemented for you can also see in the click on in the hierarchy of the class you see all the practices in which anything of those this class is defined as like an extension method or the package that is actually defined in the class so we see all those packages in the case. And then to navigate hidden dependencies, what we created here is a view where we can see all the packages that are used by the package. So in that case, I clicked on the package OB Morphic, and then I have a command that gives me a list of all packages that are used in this class, in this package OB Morphic. So I just get a list of all packages, and then I can create and click on any of those packages in the list to see where actually these two packages are communicating to each other. So I then get the not list on the right side that shall show me all the methods of the package all the order that is communicated to that selected package and the package dependency list. So see all dependent packages and we also see all the places in source code where these dependencies are actually created. So like that with this view we can make obvious that uh, the, the hidden dependencies that they have between packages. And then another means to make visible uh, things that are not so obvious. Normally, ID is these are icons. With icons, I can give additional information about the source artifact, for instance, about the method. So, in that case, I have some other icons, for instance, that tell me 
whether a method has been overridden in a subclass or whether it overrides uh, the same method with the same name in a subclass. For this, I can use items and I can go up and I'm done. I can also see which method is defined abstract, so which self subclass responsibility. This I also show with the blue line page. The fact is that I can the information that is otherwise not visible. I can make this information better accessible. Then also something special for speed here, we provide a traits browser, so we can better see traits. We can see this browser which class is defined, or which class is using which trait. We can also see the use of a trait, so the class that use that trait, we can see in that browser. And then another thing, another point we want to address was the point about runtime information, but as you can see, what kind of things are, happen are actually happening in runtime, there are different aspects <coughs> of the IP, so here on the book, it's more, but we do not see the types of variables, so we do not know what kind of types the variables we get at runtime. So what we do here, we analyze the application while it's running, and we bring back the information, the runtime information to the ID, to be able to show which variable and was formed to which kind of type at runtime. And the means how we actually visualize that in the source code view is we use icons, so we place icons behind the variable name, and when I click on that icon, you can see what kind of types have been stored. And there's a few parts that are in the very code before. Well, I can also navigate the method sense, so I can see how I have a message sent to, for instance, populate menu with no for request, and then place an arrow behind, the green arrow behind to send the message sent to be able to just navigate from this source of view to that method that is actually implementing that message sent. And if I have a polymorphic message sent, I of course get a list of all the items, all the methods, I can basically the run and of that place in source code. And then on the right side, in the browser that you write from, I get the list of all classes, of all types that have been referenced in that particular method. I also get the same for, for the entire class, so I see all the classes and the class they communicate to at runtime. So all the dynamic references, I also see an instrument, the source code, and analyze the running of the application. And then the last point was uh, to reduce the number of windows that we have open at any point of in time in the ID. And for that, we developed an algorithm that we call open leaves. And open leaves to try to identify those windows that are not used anymore automatically. So, what we do, we try to build reference between windows. And as soon as we have a window that is not referenced by any other window, we try to suggest to automatically close that window that is not referenced by the context, by the entire context that is open in the, in the IDE right now. And technically, this works like that, that we did wait. To a window, we can also give weight to an entity, to a class, to a method, and then it's open. And then we try to find out. So we also propagate weight from one entity to the other. So if we have open the class, we also propagate weight to the package of this class. So this, like that, we can find out if another browser has opened the class of the same package. And then we have kind of reference between these two windows. And if, as soon as we detect one window, the whose weight is pretty low, pretty Close to the threshold, we try to close that window because then we can assume that it has not been referenced by any other window, so it's one window that is isolated from all the rest, from all the working context that is displayed with the other window, and then we can suggest to close it automatically. So this is one means to uh, mitigate the window plate problem. So maybe to summarize a bit again those five points, we try to represent working sets in the ID, we try to make this the code more accessible by showing it to more close to each other. So all the code is conceptually related to be at the same place in the ID, so we can easily navigate from one related code, piece of code to the other. And we also try to visualize and make emphasis by um, hidden dependencies. And another the fourth means is to integrate runtime information so that we also see the runtime and dynamic dependencies from one field of source code to the other. And then the fifth point is to reduce the window plate by suggesting to automatically close some windows that are likely to not be used anymore in the future. So these are the five ideas we try to 
show you in this uh, paper. So now, if you have any questions, please. Yes? Um, just two questions. The one is, have you tested or got any statistics for the use of IDE after the improvement to see what changes it makes in the actual use? Um, not yet. We are working on that, actually. So we will do experiments, empirical experiments, to gather this statistical data, but we haven't yet done that. No. Okay. And the second part would be, are you planning to extend this at all with visualization similar to what Moose provides? Uh, in terms of, uh, for example, identifying dependencies and finding usage densities and things like that, in similar ways to the, the graphs, etc. provided by Moose? Um, we are actually did integrate some visualizations. I didn't show them, but we have some like system complexity rule, like uh, class blueprints. They are also integrated. And some other means to specifically key navigate uh, runtime runtime dependencies so that they can navigate the uh, call stack. Basically, this is also kind of integrated. Yeah, but we haven't integrated uh, the screenshots for them. But there are parts integrated. Well, I don't have a question actually, uh, but uh, when I was working in Smalltalk, mm -hmm. I very quickly ran the same problems you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Yeah. Too many windows, too many switches, you know. Yeah. And uh, finally I started to improve the browser and add uh, three or four things. First was the back and forward button like in web browser, mm -hmm. that speed up a lot. Okay. Then, uh, also inspired by web browsers, a uh, quick shortcut to access the survey bar, like uh, control L or something like that. This is in, in uh, Firefox, I think. Yes. Uh, and the last thing uh, was borrowed from the Eclipse ID or NetBeans. Uh, I call it uh, control click. So when I hold control and move over the source code, uh, the source entities like class names and selectors and instance variables are somewhat highlighted, underlined. Also. And for instance, if I uh, highlight the selector, I just click <coughs> and uh, a list of senders or implementers will uh, be shown and I choose most of the time the right one. And my personal feeling is that uh, it's really speed up the development. Mm -hmm. So consider such changes. Okay. I think the most valuable is the control click navigation. Yeah. So that's the comment. Yes, please. Sort of building on from the last user, Dolphin does a lot of these things. It would be interesting if you ran your experiment with some Dolphin users with the same tests that you did, uh -huh. because it has a lot of these things that this fellow at the back has just described. So there's a lot of good ideas in there. I mean, not everything works perfectly, but there's certainly some areas to kind of study. And an obvious one would be to run your, your test on that.